If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So Rich Roll, you won't like that. What I knew of this guy, dude's a badass man. Yeah, so I didn't know much about him except for this fucker's podcast is always highly ranked <laughs> on iTunes. <laughs> He's always one of the top podcasts, right? Of course, you bring that up yeah. first. Yeah. Well, because that's how we knew. That's how we first knew of this guy. Like when we first started Mind Pump, we looked at the top podcasts. And he's he's always up he, there, right? He owns it. He he's owns always that top up space. there. And then yeah. we passed him a couple times. Yeah. What's up, Rich? <laughs> uh, but he's a super. He's a good dude. Super good yeah. guy. We actually went up to he's his. Got a, dude, he's got a hell of a story. Yeah. Oh my god. I mean, yeah. I, and I love that he's like an open book when it comes to like battling addiction. And I think mm-hmm. there's so many people that suffer with all these different types of addiction. So I think that's a lot of where his success is. very is. relatable. Yeah, you, he definitely is very, very transparent. He's shared all of his story. He invited us in his home. I mean, yep. that's where we recorded yeah. the podcast. Uh, beautiful home. Oh, it was a great home. It was he's, awesome. He's your, like, he is a super achiever. He's, he's one of those people that um, pretty much anything he does, he achieves at a high level. I mean, he, uh, he was, went to Stanford University. Uh, Cornell Law School was a successful lawyer before he got into the fitness space and now he's obviously dominating there with some uh some top selling books in the fitness space obviously he's got a very popular podcast it's the rich roll podcast um and his website is richroll.com um here we are here we are talking to uh rich roll Enjoy. the man tell us how you got started in all of this man let's go because we, we i we see your podcasts on the top of the charts. We started Mind Pump about three years ago, and your podcast was always kind of up there. Very interesting. And I, I want our audience to know kind of what got you into, into all of this. Podcast Podcasting and fitness. Just, yeah, let's just talk about the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so how far back do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, a, uh, I, was a, uh, I was a swimmer growing up. I swam at Stanford in the late 1980s, um, which at the time was the number one collegiate swimming program in the country. We won into two A's. Uh, two two of the years that I was there, uh, and you know I was training with the guys that that uh, you know held world records and American records, NC two A champions, Olympic gold medalists, and the like. But I was very much a bench warmer. <laughs> you know, I was not. I was by no means a star. Hmm. Uh, and then uh, I never really fully achieved my potential as an athlete there. I got more interested in partying, drugs, and alcohol. Kind of took center stage and. That took me on a whole journey that ultimately I bottomed out at uh, around age 31, ended up in rehab for 100 days, got clean and sober. And then in the wake of that, my life became all about trying to repair the wreckage that I'd created as a result of being an irresponsible reprobate alcoholic <laughs> and uh, threw myself into, into workaholism, really. Uh, I was a lawyer at the time. And uh, was very much intent on on trying to get back on track. And uh, by the time I was in my mid mid thirties, late thirties, I was on the partnership track at a prestigious law firm in Los Angeles. Had all the stuff. Met my wife. We were building this house. Had a really nice sports car in the driveway. Uh, so from the outside looking in, it looked like I had a pretty good life. Um, but on the inside, I was kind of dying. I was dying spiritually. I was dying emotionally. I was really like not happy in my career choices. And, uh, and, and very much unfulfilled. And during that period of time in which I'd kind of transferred a lot of my alcoholic tendencies into workaholism, I also wasn't taking care of myself physically. Like, even though I was an athlete in college, like, that was done. Did you, you know? know it, though, when you were going through it? Or is this you looking back going... I didn't give a shit. You know, I was yeah. just like, I, you know, I just need to be... Like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to achieve the American dream. Right. You know, that's what I was focused on. And so my diet consisted of, you know, fast food, basically, you know, hitting the drive through on the way home, take out Chinese at the law firm, all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, that's fine. You can kind of get by a little bit when you're in your, you know, twenties and your, you know, metabolism is churning, but as you start to get older, yeah, it's like, it starts (laughs) to add up. And so by the time I was 39, I was about 50 pounds overweight. So I was never like a super obese person or anything like that. I was just, I look like a guy who like is a, you know, trying to be a partner in a law firm, riding riding an elevator Mm -hmm. up and down all day long. Um, classic couch potato, just didn't have good energy. You know, just want, all I want to do is park myself in front of the TV at night and just kind of unenthusiastic about my life. And so what happened was, 
Um, shortly before I turned 40, I had a bit of a health scare where I was walking up that flight of stairs that you saw over there um, late one night after working a long day and had to pause half, halfway up, like oh, winded, wow. out of breath, tightness in my chest, like buckled over. And how like old are you? 39. I was okay. 39 at the time. And it was scary. You know, heart disease runs in my family. My grandfather, uh, who I'd never met, was also a champion swimmer, captain of the University of Michigan swim team in the late 1920s, Olympic hopeful, American record holder, the whole deal. Died of a heart attack at 54. Wow. Despite never being overweight or not being a smoker or anything like that. So my mom, my whole life was like, you got to watch what you eat, got to watch what you eat. And you're like, yeah, bah, 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 or, you know, right. whatever, you know, until you have that, you know, your own reckoning experience. So I had that experience. And it's a longer story, but really that was the beginning point, like my bottom with lifestyle that was similar to my bottom with drugs and alcohol, where I realized like, I really need to make a change. And I need to take that, that process of changing my life as seriously as I took getting clean and sober. And that, that kind of launched me into this, um, search for a new way of living that ultimately led me to adopting a plant-based diet, which repaired my health and allowed me to drop all this weight and feel good in, in my own body again, and gave me the enthusiasm to, to, to move myself physically for the first time in a long time. And so I began working out again, very casually, like I had no interest or desire to returning to becoming a competitive athlete in my forties. I just wanted to like, not be fat. Feel good. Yeah. I didn't want mm. to tire around the waist and I wanted to be able to like have fun with my kids and not get worn out and all that kind of stuff. But so you didn't take that kind of that addictive personality and apply it to the, towards exercise at this point? Not initially, not initially. Uh, I was very um, diligent about once I'd, I'd kind of figured out that eating plant-based was working for me, I became um, pretty focused on trying to figure out how to do that right. Did and it feel good right away when you switched over? Within about seven to 10 days, I felt a dramatic difference, wow. you know, and I played around with a couple other ways of eating to no avail. And this just seemed to really work for mm -hmm. me. And so, and this was before all the documentaries and all the kind of stuff that has made it a little bit more mainstream because this was back in, I mean, this was 11 years ago. Yeah. Cause now you can test so. to see that there's different polymorphisms, right? Some people do respond very, very well to a plant-based mm -hmm. diet and other people you know, more in the other direction. Yeah. And this was an experiment with an N of one. I mean, this was just me trying to pay attention to like what felt good for me mm -hmm. and this seemed to be working. And so I just launched myself into, into it and have never really looked back because it's always agreed with me. But yeah, I mean, what happened was, you know, I lost the weight pretty quickly and every week I started feeling better and better. I went back to the pool. I, you know, we live, there's all these amazing trails right around here. I started exploring them for the first time. Like I'd lived here for years mm. without ever going out on them. Oh, that's crazy. And, uh, and I was improving really rapidly. I'd never been a runner and my wife bought me a bike for my 40th birthday. I'd never really ridden a bike before. And, and, uh, I had this experience about, I don't know, it must've been about three, four months into this experience this experiment where I've been kind of working out regularly, but nothing too crazy. And I went out for a run, uh, on a local trail around here and just had one of those experiences where everything clicks and you're kind of in this flow state. Mm -hmm. I ended up running like 24 miles that morning, oh, which is way longer than anything. <laughs> well, I've hold ever on a second. Done. So you're not, you're, you're never really doing this. Well, I've been got, yeah, the ba the longest run I'd done up to that point was maybe six or seven miles. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. Just four yeah. times. But it was one going. of those days, you know, you, I'm sure you have those days in the gym where you just feel like unbreakable. Unstoppable. Right? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you so, nailed it. You hit yeah. flow state. When you hit flow state right. like that, everything just, whew. And so I had this crazy experience and, and I thought like either I just unlocked some crazy dormant gene that I didn't know that I had, or there's something about this lifestyle that's agreeing with me in a way that I didn't initially realize or some combination of those two things. And that's what started getting me interested in, in, uh, in, in my own inner potential, you know, cause, cause it, it hadn't been that long since I was sort of a couch potato. And I was like, wow, in a very short period of time, like I've made some pretty drastic, significant changes what would happen if I pushed the envelope on this? Like, where could I take this? And, and I think it was fueled in part by the fact that I didn't um, achieve my potential as a swimmer in college. And so there was some unfinished business there to attend to, I think, that had always bugged me. And so that's what kind of got me uh, interested in the world of ultra endurance sports. Where do you think the self-awareness came for, for you? Are you always a self-aware person? Or are you kind of valued? Where'd that come from? Which, what do you mean self? Well, I mean, what even like that? what you're talking about right now, like you, you are, are sharing this, like a lot of people are just, 
not in touch with how exercise is affecting their body, how nutrition is affecting their body. You have this scare and now all of a sudden you're paying attention to all this or were you mm-hmm. paying attention to things like that before? I mean, was it that that really propelled the... I don't, that's an interesting question. I don't know if, if I've ever really been asked that question in that way before. I think because, because 12 step had, had repaired my life so dramatically as a result of getting sober and, and being part of the recovery community here in Los Angeles, I was aware that, that, uh, I was aware that people are more capable of change than we believe right? Because not only had I changed dramatically, I'd, I'd been firsthand witness to seeing a lot of my friends repair their lives, like coming back from, you know, like I was a pretty pedestrian drunk, right? But I have friends who were just, you know, living on skid row, gutter rat, heroin mm-hmm. addicts, like, or friends that were literally look like they were clinically insane, like bouncing off the walls. And I'd seen them become productive members of society. And it, it's pretty dramatic when you're, when you're kind of there to watch that evolution. And so, I think that experience made me realize that we put a cap on our own potential in other areas. And I think the diet thing kind of further illuminated that for me and made me start to think about, well, where else am I turning a blind eye to what I'm capable of? And I think, you know, the, the world of ultra endurance sports seemed like a pretty good template to kind of explore that question for myself. Now, did this further your interest in self-growth in other areas as well besides fitness? To an extent, yeah. Uh, you know, most of my self growth at that time was was being pursued through through the recovery community. Um, this this seemed initially more like, oh, I want to be an athlete again, and it's it's turned and grown into much more than that, because I think the process of training for these races is an exercise in mindfulness in its own right. You have to spend so much time with yourself and. You know, although one of the 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 steps in twelve step is meditation, it doesn't really get as much attention as it should. And so I started getting involved in meditation and exploring that. And you know, my podcast, which you know came much later, uh, as you guys, as we were kind of talking about before the podcast, like you get exposed to all these amazing people that 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 kind of energize you to explore other areas of your life. And and so a lot of the personal growth stuff has come, you know, in recent years as a result of the experience of doing, of doing what did, you guys are doing. Did you ever have any chance? So I, I battle with addiction um, and mine was painkillers uh-huh. and, and I had friends, same real similar stories. And something that I noticed common with, with all of us was we tend to trade one for the other at first. Yeah. Did you ever, ever deal with that where you, okay, sure. I moved on from that, but mm-hmm. didn't realize like, oh, now I'm just becoming so consumed with something else. Yeah. The thing I think that a lot of people don't realize about, about addiction is that the drug, uh, or the alcohol, whatever this, if it's a substance based addiction, um, that is the solution, not the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the solution that works for a while to an under underlying malaise or problem that if left unaddressed, even if you take away the substance remains and will continue to fester. Right. And I think that's not initially self-evident to most people that get sober. They think I'm, I'm going to quit drugs and alcohol. I'm going to be cool now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They don't realize now that they're gambling now they're and sitting, hookers or yeah, something. <laughs> they're sitting with like all of these emotions without the tools to deal with it. Right. right? And so you see a lot of that. You see a lot of acting out with different kinds of behavior, whether it's, uh, you know, gambling or porn or or sex or shopping or television, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Any, any behavior to take you out of the moment to help you escape from whatever discomfort that you're experiencing. Right. So recovery, true sobriety is like addressing those emotional problems and working through them so that you can be comfortable in your own skin. But that's a process and that takes many years. The only way through is through. <clears throat> yeah, the it. only way is through. So in early years of sobriety, a lot of people, most people, myself included, will act out in different ways, right? So, you know, I channeled a lot of that into workaholism and into food addiction. Like I would hear people talking about food addiction and I'd be like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. You know, meanwhile, I'm going to in and out and like Wendy's or McDonald's every day, you know, I'm totally unaware that I was medicating myself through my food choices, that that was a way to like solve whatever wounds I had that mm-hmm. still remained for me to, to deal with. Right. And so, yeah, I did that for a long time and slowly developed self-awareness of that. And I still, you know, look, I got a million character defects and my, I'm an extreme person by nature and, and I want to act out in a million different ways. Um, and you can use 
whatever, you know, you can use running, swimming, cycling, triathlon, ultra endurance, all these sorts of things can be used addictively or alcoholically, right? It's right. about your relationship to those. Mm -hmm. and, and I've had experiences where I see myself moving in that direction because people will say like, oh, you do these crazy long races, you just transferred your addiction onto something else. Mm. And a lot of people, cause there's a lot of people in recovery that get into ultra <laughs> sports, you know, it's like, oh, the pain, you know, it's like, there's something about it that's attractive that you see lots of people with tons, of, tons of tattoos and tons of, you know, tons of people who have been, you know, drug addicts and the like. Um, so I always say, yeah, you know, yeah, there's an element to that. Mm. That's true, of course. Um, but for me, uh, the drug or the drink was always the easy choice, the way mm. out. And like doing these events is hard, right? Mm. It requires discipline. It requires a whole battery of you have to like be healthy, emotional yeah. maturity to deal with it. Um, you can have an unhealthy relationship with it, but I'm also a father. I've got four kids. I'm married. I'm doing a million things. And so mm. I'm always trying to, you know, objectively analyze, uh, my relationship with all of these different things to make sure that they're, that they're in balance. They may not be balanced, on a daily basis, but over the course, if you look, you know, sort of looking down over the course of a year or six months, everything balances. Now, did you come right out with this quest, this message of, of change like on the podcast? Was that what you started to kind of talk about right away? Like how you were able to overcome this addiction and, um, or were you more like, like ultra marathoning, like, uh, based? No, it was, I, I, my podcast, I've always wanted to cast like a really wide net and talk about a whole variety of things. It's not a, it was never intended or conceptualized to be a vegan podcast or a triathlon podcast mm -hmm. or a running podcast. What happened was, um, I mean, we can get into it if you want, but I did all these crazy ultra endurance events and I did quite well in a few of them. And I'd done this one thing that no one had ever done before. And it got a bunch of media attention and people were interested. Like this guy is 43, 44, he's doing all this crazy stuff and he's doing it without eating any animal products. Like, how does that work? So there was a bunch of stuff that got written up about me and that led to a book deal. And I wrote this memoir, Fighting Ultra, that came out in 2012. Um, and and at the time, it, I wasn't like as well known as I am now. So after I did everything I could to push that book out, I was like, well, what's next? And I thought like, well, a podcast could be cool. And this was late 2012. Podcasting wasn't new, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't cool either. Right. You know, it's yeah. like, it's just, it was, it's just now kind of getting, there cool were some, it. yeah, there were some good shows, but it, but there wasn't a lot of depth. Like they, yeah. they fell off a cliff pretty quick. And I realized in the health space, there was, there was a couple interesting things there, but, but there wasn't a lot. Right. And I'd love the medium because when I would go out and train, I got in these six, eight hour bike rides. Like you can't listen to music the whole time. Right. And I would listen to audiobooks, and I got interested in podcasts and I was like, this is a really cool medium. So I thought maybe there's something for me to explore there. And I started mine without any, I didn't have an agenda that it was going to be this big show. I didn't know if I would do episode two. I didn't even know what it would be. I just turned a mic on and, hmm. and started talking. And my first episode was with my wife. We were living in Hawaii at the time. And, uh, and it just has evolved very organically into what it is today. But from the beginning, I had this idea that I wanted to be able to have conversations that weren't just about the sport that I do or the way that I eat, but how we can all be better in many different ways. I mean, I guess the, the, the probably the main theme of it is, you know, how can we live more, uh, more integrated, more authentically mm. to who we really are, do right? You, do you find a therapeutic element to podcasting? I know I do. I know of for course. me, yeah. You know, we were talking about that beforehand too. You get to talk to these amazing people, hold them hostage for however long, <laughs> yeah. you know, ask, them, yeah. the them to ask all these questions and they have to answer it because <laughs> it's getting recorded. Uh, yeah. It's like, you know, having this huge, uh, board of advisors for your life where you get to ask them everything you want to know and then share that. Like it's super powerful and it's intimate and like. I'm sure you've experienced this where the people that you have on as guests become your friends. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's just been an extraordinary thing for me personally. And it has helped me develop as a human being in like huge traumatic ways. Let's talk about that. That's Some great. of the people that, uh, do you have certain people that have really, uh, altered how you deal with things or that become friends like that come right to mind that you've thought of that you've interviewed? Yeah. I mean, part of that's like, how do you choose your babies? You know what I mean? Like, people I'm sure ask you, <laughs> who's, who's your, your favorite, favorite guest? <laughs> you know, you can't, that's, oh, that's really tough to do. Um, I had so many different kinds of people like, and I, and I talk about addiction and recovery and I talk about diet and nutrition and fitness and training and, and mindfulness and all these. So there's, there's, there's people that, that cut across all of those categories. I think, um, a lot of the meditation and mindfulness guests that I've had from Sharon Salzberg to my friend, 
uh, Charlie Knowles, who's an amazing meditation teacher. Like I'd always been somebody who kind of gave it lip service. I'd kind of do it here or there, but I was never really fully committed and wasn't, wasn't really sure I was completely sold on the promise that, that, that everyone was talking about. But I think because I had so many people on and, and had so many interesting conversations about it that I was able to kind of take that leap and commit to it in a way that maybe I wouldn't have otherwise. And that's been super transformative. I had Gabor Mate on, who's an, uh, an expert in addiction, and that like blew my mind because it turned into a personal like therapy mm. session for oh, wow. me, oh, you wow. know, right. uh, which was incredible. And I've had amazing athletes on. I mean, my most recent guest was Lance Armstrong, and that was you know that was an, an How did amazing that go? experience. Yeah. It was it was cool. It was tricky. You know, he's an intense individual, right? Oh, really? yeah. Going into that, like you know, you know, you're in for uh, you're gonna you're in for a ride, and and as I said in the intro to that. You know, I, I'm not I'm not there to judge him or to mm-hmm. be judge and jury or anything. And I'm not an investigative journalist. I just wanted to have an intimate discussion with him and figure out like what makes this guy tick and how he's dealing with certain things that the average human being doesn't have to deal with. You know, how is he moving forward and all of that? How and, how often have you been challenged to break through on people? And have you had some guests you just like Fuck, I just can't get through this guy? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me. When I go into these interviews, for me, and this is just my own personal thing, it's it's less about the information that the guest is is uh, is sharing, and more about me being able to connect with that person emotionally, right? And some people are ready to go there all the way, and some people aren't, and so it's about finding that edge and that line. Um, but there's something about looking somebody in the eye, right, yeah. and and being present with them that allows for a little bit of magic to happen. And so I go into it prepared, but also open to allowing it to go wherever it wants to go. And like you said, like some people go places you never, you, you, you're hoping they'll go, but you never thought that they would. Like I had Travis Barker on the podcast, um, the drummer for Blink-182, yeah. yeah. no, amazing rock star. And, and, you know, I really wanted to talk to him about this plane crash that he survived, mm-hmm. that his friend, uh, DJ Adam, yeah, Ultimate AM, yeah. uh, ultimately perished from. And I wasn't sure if he wanted to talk about it, but we Mm. got into it and it it became incredibly emotional, you know, for him to recount that. And like for me, for some, for a guest to trust me in that way and to be able to share on that level, for me, those are some of my favorite episodes. When I can get to that level of honesty with people is rare and not everyone's willing to go there. But when you can get that, like, I think that's a beautiful Mm. thing. I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, if we could go back a little bit to the, you know, your initial uh, stint with uh, alcoholism. Um, you know, the, our attitude towards addiction is starting to change, which I think is a good thing. We're starting to realize, like you said, that it's not really the substance. It's, you know, what's behind that. It's the solution. When you look back, cause it was a while ago now, can you identify what it was you were trying to distract yourself from? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's a question that I get a lot. Um, and of course I've put thought into that, but I've also learned that spending a lot of time trying to figure out like why I'm an alcoholic is not necessarily the healthiest, um, pursuit or, uh, or use of my time and energy. Mm. Like I know that I am, and I know what the solution Mm. is. So I can go down the rabbit hole of like, oh, you know, this happened to me and that happened to me and, and all of that. Ultimately it doesn't necessarily inform the solution in a fundamental way. Cause I know what I need to do to stay sober and to, and to live as sober as possible. But I think, you know, to speak to that, I was just born, um, I was born uncomfortable. You know, I always felt apart from, I had difficulty making friends as a kid. I was very isolated. Um, I had trouble making, you know, I was like the kid who got picked last for kickball. Like there was no indication that I was going to be an athlete. Yeah, like, you, I was you and like, Lewis Howes had the same you know, story like, there. <laughs> I had the headgear, uh, orthodontia and I had an eye patch over my eye. Cause I'm cross-eyed. Like I was not a vision for you as a young kid. I was gangly and uncoordinated and just super insecure and just walked around feeling like everybody knew what was going on except for me, you know, and swimming was the first thing that I kind of stumbled onto that I actually had like a natural inclination for. And that became like my, my kind of home, like this safe place that I could go. But, you know, I was bullied in high school and all of that. I had a lot of those experiences and grew up in a household where, where there wasn't like explicit pressure to perform, but it was a very education focused upbringing where there was a certain way that, um, I was going to be and live. And I felt pressure to like, 
live up to that in certain ways. And so I think I was always a square peg trying to jam into a, a round hole and spent many years as a lawyer trying to like be this person that I thought I was supposed to be and ignoring this other side of me that wanted to be something else because I didn't feel like that opportunity was available to me. And I think that, um, that dissonance, like that, that disconnect from really taking the time to look at myself honestly and say, well, what do I want to be? What do I want to do? Like, I never asked myself those questions. It was just study hard, get the best grades, you know, get into the best school that you can. I got into like, you know, I got into every college I applied to. I was like a kid who at a very young age, like had overcome that awkwardness to achieve some level of academic and athletic success. So that when I was a senior in high school, I was getting recruited by all these colleges. I got into Harvard. I got into Princeton. Like I was being groomed to be this ultra successful person. Um, but I never once asked myself, like, is this even what I want? Right. You know? And, and, uh, I just went along with it because that's climbing the ladder on the path Crazy to right achieving this American that. dream. And, you know, the first, you know, the cracks in the veneer started when I got, when I moved, you know, for, I grew up in Washington, DC and I go 3000 miles away to go to college and I'm away from home for the first time. And I just go bananas on partying, you know, because it was like an outlet. I didn't even know how uncomfortable I was in my own skin, you know, and I was starting to discover that, that, that what made me feel okay. Like, I remember the first time I got drunk and it was like this warm blanket enveloped me for the first time. And I was like, Oh, oh wow. mm. this is how you're supposed to feel. Like I can oh. take a breath. Like I can exhale. Like I feel comfortable for the first time. I was like, I want to do this all the time, you know? And it worked for me for a long time. It allowed me to become a social animal and, you know, I figured out how I could talk to a girl, you know, or crack a joke and do things that I never felt like I would ever be able to do. So, you know, it's not just, oh, it destroyed my life. Like it actually well, propelled things. Yeah, probably. yeah exactly. You, it, a lot of success yeah. from it's it for sure. Yeah, perspective. Yeah. 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 So it works until it stops working, right. you know, and then like when it stops working, everything goes to shit. But, you know, <laughs> there was a good many years in there where, you know, I had a lot of fun with it. Right. Yeah. So how, how did how did the, the bullying, feeling isolated, how does that affect you now as an adult and your relationships with people now? I think I'm I think. uh I think I have um, a huge reservoir of compassion and empathy for other people. And I think I experienced that most recently in my, in my conversation with Lance, you know, everybody has an opinion of that guy and emotions run hot. And, you know, there's a lot of people that can't, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I just go into it like, you know, my life was broken. There was a period of time where like my family wouldn't talk to me. I was sleeping on a bare mattress in a shitty apartment with no furniture. I was about to get fired from my law firm job. I had two DUIs. I was looking at jail time. Like wow. I lost all my friends. I'm hanging out with lower companions. I'm going on multi-day benders where I don't even remember where, where I am. You know, my bank account's overdrawn. Like it was not good at the end. It was pretty fucking dark. And, and the prospect of like, facing that and walking through it and rebuilding your life is difficult. And I have a lot of empathy for that. So I don't walk around in judgment of other people's experiences, you know, because I've, I've gone through hard times and I've seen other people go through hard times and, and I've done a lot of bullshit, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't want to be judged for that. And, you know, my path forward is to own it and, and to be transparent about it. Um, in hopes that that is helpful to other people that are struggling in the same way. So I'm very empathetic to to people in general and and especially the guests that I have on the podcast. Well, well growth doesn't happen from being comfortable. I mean, it comes yeah. from being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Do you view feeling uncomfortable as a gift? Yeah, I have a huge capacity to tolerate being uncomfortable. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> ultra for better there. or worse. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like when your life's going downhill, like. And, and I'm still drinking and partying despite, you know, my world collapsing on, you know, on top of me. <laughs> I pain, got this. <laughs> even though I'm suffering all that pain, it's like, I'm going to keep going. You know, it's not painful enough yet. Let's make it more painful. But, mm. you know, I learned that as a young person in my swimming career, you know, all throughout high school, I'm getting up at 430 in the morning and going to swim practice before school and then training another two hours after school. And I was never the most gifted uh, swimmer, athlete. But I learned at an early age that I could overcome a big portion of that talent deficit gap by overworking, like working harder than the next person. And I would put in these insane sets that like my coaches from that period still talk about because people like just don't do some of the stuff that I was doing. 
Um, and and I, I was able to channel that into my workaholism and then into the ultra endurance world. Like I can tolerate pain probably better than most. All I know is my own experience, but there's something about, um, about the ability to step into and weather discomfort that I think most of us are either scared of, we run away from it, we can figure our lives to avoid it. And in my experience, and I think you would agree with me, like the willingness to bring that into your life not only um, is the way forward and the way to grow, but it also it also makes you feel alive. You know, people are struggling with being happy and they think the answer to happiness is to create more luxury and ease in their life. And the truth is quite the opposite. Well, this is why you see these Spartan races and stuff exploding. Right. Right? We're exploding right now because we're becoming so plugged in mm-hmm. and, and so de- comfortable. And, yeah, and yeah. detached from ourselves that people want to feel that feeling of discomfort again. It's, yeah. 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 I have, it's great. Like when you think about it, like if you were an alien who came down to Earth and said, why are these people like signing up for this stuff, <laughs> right. getting all muddy? <laughs> pain, and right, pain. Like, it looks no ridiculous. Sense. Because they're spending, you know, 50 hours a week at a cubicle and their life is very predictable and there's something very primal about getting muddy and mixing it up and doing all of these things that we have just divorced ourselves from in such a fundamental way. Uh, And I think, you know, it's beautiful to see these races exploding and people having these experiences of connecting with themselves in a physical way. Where do you see us going in the future? Right in line with what you're talking about right now, like where where do you see us going? Like as far as a society, do you think we're going to get worse before we get better with being plugged in? Or do you think that you're going to see more of these events happening and people are going to start waking up? I think it's a bifurcation. You know, I think we're in we're in this super, I mean, things are getting weird. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. culture's getting weird. Um, we're in a race against time. Like we're either going to destroy our planet, you know, in the next hundred years, or we're going to figure out a way forward. And so I see like both of those things happen, happening simultaneously. On the one hand, you know, the environmental wreckage that we're creating is just insane. And the blind eye that so many people are turning to it makes no sense. Meanwhile, we have people who are innovating, you know, new ways of feeding the planet as Mm -hmm. we move towards 10 billion people, you know, all these sort of lab grown meats and like new ways of eradicating factory farming so that we can feed. I mean, it's like, it's crazy what's going on. And you have, you know, in, in, in parallel with things like, um, obstacle course racing or triathlon or marathoning or any of these kind of healthy physical pursuits. We have the development of virtual reality and AI and people, you know, with the ability to plug more and more into like, not just these, but, you know, devices that are even more addictive and, and more, um, all encompassing. So these things are butting up against each other and it's going to be interesting to see how it splits our society and which way we're going to go. And I think that, you know, it's, it's uh, it's coming fast, man. It's, it's coming very, very. Well, you have fast. kids, right? You said you yeah. have four of them. Yeah. So how's that been? How's that been being a parent? How 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 much of a challenge has that been, or what have you? Yeah, it's been interesting. You know, we've uh, we've done the best that that uh, that we can with navigating this. But you know, like these these devices, these phones, this is part of the fabric of our lives. And you know, I you know, it's we such tr- a new challenge, try to, right? Yeah, it's like this is the first generation of kids who are being reared on this from the very beginning. Right. Um, and what is that going to look like? You know, so I'm not, I can't tell my kids, you can't use these things. We try to police the hours around it and kind of, um, you know, have healthy boundaries around when it's appropriate to use them and when it's not. Um, but also I think it's important for kids to be, uh, to be fluent in the language of what is happening because that's currency for, you know, how, 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 you know, their professional lives are, are going to unfold. So it's not about not using it. At the same time, like we got rid of our television maybe eight years ago. We don't have a TV. We haven't had a TV. Our little girls who are now 10 and 13 have never watched television. I mean, but they're on YouTube, sure. you know, and and even if we had a TV, they'd probably just be on YouTube anyway because they don't watch that's, they don't that's TV. They have zero yeah. interest in that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so yeah. watching that has been interesting. Um, have, you re- so, have you heard of the book Irresistible? No, how by Adam Atler, great read. Yeah, yeah, and they talk about just. I mean, we've only had Facebook and this and these phones yeah. enabled like this for ten years, so mm-hmm. we're just now starting to see some of the research, research and studies. We have like uh, back pain and children now coming up because of their posture and stuff. Crazy, yeah, and and they're talking. And the, here's the, the scary part, and why I always recommend people, anybody who has kids, I always say you know read that book. It's a great book. Uh, is where where it's heading in the future is. When you get somebody who has alcoholism, addiction to drugs, something like that, you can see it on their body. Like if I'm an outside person looking in and you're grossly addicted to something, you, you, I can see it on you. And you look bad. I'm like, oh, man, he's addicted to something or bad, right? And people shame people like that. 
But this has become something that it's a tool. And it's like you can make a lot of money if you get good at using this tool right. and we celebrate it. And it's, oh, the next, this is better, this is faster. And no one's really talking about the addictive properties that are happening huh. to the mm-hmm. point that I find it extremely fascinating that the people that created these things don't let their kids really use them. Right. Yeah, there was that guy, Tristan, I forget his last name. He was on Sam Harris's podcast, Waking Up, uh, a little while ago, who uh, I can't remember whether he is an ex-Googler or someone. He worked at a huge tech company and has really studied this. And he's the one, kind of the face of of the Silicon Valley community who's coming out and saying, let's take a real look at what's actually going on here. And Mm. the vast extent to which these companies are investing millions of dollars in research into how to create the most highly addictive, time-consuming application possible, right? And that's frightening, you know, it's frightening. And as, as somebody who, you know, is an addict at my core, like I catch myself all the time and I'm like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Like I, I'm, I'm, you know, I have to create rules for myself around using these devices because I go down the rabbit hole as well. And when you have small children, you know, you can see it happening, you Mm -hmm. know, and it's, it's frightening. And so as a parent, what is your responsibility or obligation towards managing that in, in, in a developing mind. It reminds me a lot of the parallels uh, between you know, the te- technology in our kids and when food started to become highly processed, mm-hmm. highly palatable. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of the same thing in the sense that you know, I grew up in the 80s and we were starting to understand you know, that, that you probably shouldn't be eating a lot of the stuff, but it really isn't, wasn't known like it is now. And kids were, we were, when we were kids, it was just fed to us, no problem. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Yeah. And it wasn't really policed. You know, I'd come home yeah. from, you know, trick or treating, and it was, my mom didn't tell me you can only have four pieces of candy. I'd go in my room with my pillow sack. I'd <laughs> right. eat until I got sick. And now parents I was kinda, hot pockets and, left and right. And, yeah. And, and, exactly. Yeah. And now parents kind of understand. And I think. The same thing is happening with technology with kids where parents don't realize really what's, you know, how bad it is. And so, you know, they're doing stuff in the house and the kids are quiet playing on the iPad. We're like, what's the big deal? They're, Mm -hmm. you know, they're occupying themselves, not realizing that they could be causing problems. And I think what's going to happen is like what's happened with food is we're going to see a lot of problems come up and then people are going to start to become aware and start to say, oh, wait a minute. Now we can identify it. Yeah. Now I need to limit my kids. I need to police them and say, you can only be on for an hour a week or you know, or whatever. So I see it being a completely new challenge, but very similar to the ones that we've, uh, you know, we've been in, kept been going through with food. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what all of this looks like in 20 years. I think one of the, one of the, one of the kind of o- overarching rules that, that I use or that we use, um, is distinguishing between passive use and active use in the sense that there's a distinction, a fundamental distinction between watching somebody else's creative output, like watching a YouTube video versus like using Minecraft, Minecraft or some other kind of application to build something mm-hmm. where you're, oh, you're Minecraft. using your creative energy to actually, if you're going to be on it, at least be creating something mm-hmm. as opposed to just absorbing somebody else's creative. Or distracting yourself. Do you actually have that conversation with the kids? That's a yeah, real, yeah, yeah. I'm that's like, rad. I'm yeah. like less observing, more creating. That's know? rad. Yeah. That you so if you're going to be like on that. it, like there has to be that, there has to be a balance on the, that's typically towards the creative part as right. opposed mm-hmm. to just absorbing somebody else. My son just got into the stop motion camera and he does like Lego like animation stuff with mm-hmm. it now and it's like I do kind of want to encourage him yeah, to be creative cool. like that, right? right? It's cool. Yeah, make a video, you know, right. yeah. even if it's just, you know, playing with filters on a on a on a on a photograph whatever it is, at least you're doing something as yeah. opposed to just scrolling through somebody's feed or like mm. watching. I'm going right. to steal that. That's a good. Know? Yeah. It's or good. just being very distracted. Does, does the whole family eat a plant based diet as well? Does your, do your kids eat that way or is it a yeah, challenge? They do. Yeah. I mean, it's been, you know, I started this 11 years ago, so it's, it's been a, it's been a journey. You know, each kid has had their own different. Cause it's hard enough it. to get kids to eat a particular yeah. way. Yeah. So. Well right. now, I mean, we live in this bubble. Like not only are we in Los Angeles, my two daughters now go to a school called Muse that was started by James Cameron's wife and her sister uh, and they have a plant-based lunch at school. Oh, wow. It's like, you oh, know, wow. it's like the only school in the country that serves like this organic plant-based lunch every day. Uh, and my wife is an inc- incredibly talented cook, so they prefer her food, which made it easier. Um, and that's not to say that, that, you know, when my 10 year old goes over to her friend's house or goes to a birthday sure. party, I'm not going to be the dad who tells her she can't <laughs> have pizza or cake. Like it's less about, that than it is trying to instill in them uh, healthy habits around food and educating them whenever possible, whether we're at the supermarket or 
in the preparation of the food. We involve them in the cooking to use every, every aspect of food as a, a homeschool opportunity to help them better understand their choices so that 10, 20 years from now, like that's what I'm interested in. How are they going to be eating 20 years from now? Not mm-hmm. like, did you have the cake at the birthday party? Right, right. It yeah. could also backfire, right? If you do it the wrong way, like you think yeah. you're doing it the right way. But I, I had friends who their parents were extremely strict when it came to nutrition and the second they got out of the house, of course, it was oh, like rebelled. they rebelled. Yeah, yeah. You, guys, Busters. you guys remember the kid, uh, the Hercules kid? Do you remember oh, him? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that kid? kid with no. the six pack he was like five years old and he was jacked. His dad was like, I mean, they, he was feeding him all this crazy food, training him right. every day. I mean, he was all over the news. This was probably 13 years ago, yeah. 15 uh-huh. years ago. It was a big deal. And uh, I actually just saw his photos resurface and they had a whole write up on him. And he's, he wasn't way other, out of right? shape, yeah, but he definitely was not in shape. <laughs> and just like, I don't work out. I don't lift weights. Not so right. Herculean yeah. anymore. He, right? yeah. he, got away, he got away from it, like Todd Marinovich. Yeah. You know, I think, oh, yeah, um, yeah we, don't, we don't create hardness around that kind of stuff be- or judgment because that's what leads to the rebellion. You know, the kid can't wait to leave to get out of the house and go to their friend's house so they can go crazy. So we don't have rule like we don't. We, this is like how we eat at home, um, but we don't create hardcore rules so that there's nothing to like. If they come home and say, "I ate this," and my friend, okay, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I don't get pissed, you know, mm-hmm. because if I get if you create that hardness and strictness around it, then that's exactly what you get. You get that rebellion. Mm-hmm, yep. mm-hmm. What does your typical, I guess, day look like when it comes to your exercise routine? Mm-hmm. It depends on um, whether I'm preparing for an event or just in between events. You still or compete. Like thing. Yeah, I just did a crazy race in Sweden in September, but that was the first event that I'd done. Yeah, there's a, it's up there. I, was that it right there? Yeah. Swim, um, run, world championship. Oh, what what yeah, does that yeah. involve? Oh, wow, look so at the distance. So this was a race. Yeah. Uh, it's a swim, run event. It's called uh, Otillo, pronounced like Otillo in Swedish. <laughs> Um, and swim run is a, is a sport that is finding its way to America, but no one here really has heard of it. It's, it's fairly large and growing in Europe, especially Northern Europe. And this race, uh, the biggest race of the year is the swim run world championships, which takes place in the Stockholm archipelago. Um, it's about a two hour ferry ride outside of Stockholm. It looks like you do a bunch of, uh, island hopping. Yeah. So what you do is over the course of a day, you traverse 26 islands by, by sea and foot. Uh, and you do, so there's 52 transitions between swimming and running and you do the whole thing. Did you say 52? 52. You do the whole thing in a a, a wetsuit. (laughs) A modified wetsuit and and your running shoes. You're, you're so swimming, you're swimming, in your swimming with shoes? your running shoes on, hmm. and you can bring anything you want for the swim. You just have to carry it with you. So most people wear these hand paddles, right? Mm-hmm. That you then carry when you're running, and you do it in tandem with a teammate. So not as a relay, but you have to you do it together as a duo, and you have to stay 10 meters within distance of your teammate oh, the cool. entire time. That's cool. There was 150 teams that that did it this past year. Uh, I think 25 teams um, DNF'd, uh, didn't, didn't finish. Wow. And we were the fastest American team. We finished middle of the pack. I didn't have the greatest day, to be honest with you. But it was an amazing adventure. It has to be one Super of your cool. favorite. I mean, that's so It was unique. crazy. I mean, there were, the conditions that day were insane, too. We, we woke up in the morning, like, on this little island. And mm. it was sideways rain. And the wind was crazy. Oh, and the white caps on the, on the sea were just bananas. Wow. And so it was like, the thing, the thing was, a hard, the, the swimming was fine for me. I actually enjoyed it. The water was cold, but it wasn't as cold as it as, as had been in past years. It could have been a lot colder. I think it was like 56 or 55 or something like that. Um, but the running wasn't really running. It's like, it was like, it was like doing a Spartan race. It was like obstacle course racing. Cause it's like, probably rocky. The, 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 the waves would crash on these granite slabs and you can see like on the bottom lower left yeah, corner yeah, there, yeah. you're like climbing up, you're, you're trying to climb slippery. up these slabs. It's super slippery. Oh, wow. I was falling down. I wore the wrong kind of shoes. Like they weren't grippy enough and I was falling down all over the place. And then you're traipsing through these bogs with the mud, like up to your knees and climbing under like fallen trees and stuff. Like it was wild. Wow. Was, yeah. What was it? What, what, so, uh, in all the runs you've done, what was been the, the most uh, amazing moment for you? Like as far as an accomplishment or excited finish or one, like um, a couple things. I mean, there was one moment in this race. I mean, this was a 75 kilometer race, about 40 miles of run and six miles of swimming. It was like, t- took us like 10 and a half hours to do. About halfway through the race, there's the hardest swim. It's about a 
two kilometers, not the longest, but the most difficult because it was the most exposed part of water of the channel of the whole race. And the swells were like up to six feet. I mean, it was crazy. You know, the <laughs> boats that were out there were pitching. I was so like, you're like boats. surfing your way in. Or I was like, <laughs> there is no way that this race could take place in the United States. Like no insurance company would. Like, this, <laughs> yeah. this is the most dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Like nobody should be out here right now. And, but I just started laughing. Which makes it more awesome. I was right? like laughing. Epic, I was like, then. what am I even doing here? You know, like, this is crazy that, that I'm Lightning even here, but it, are... but it was like, it made me really reflect on this journey that I've been on, you know, like from being in rehab and all these obstacles that I've overcome to like get to do the things that I get to do today. I was like, I just had this like swell of gratitude. Like I was just laughing. I was like, I can't even, but like what brought me to this place that I'm like in the Baltic sea, like getting, you know, in this washing machine, you know, right now <laughs> swimming this thing. So that was definitely a highlight. Um, I, uh, in 2009, uh, the race that I've specialized in over the years is called Ultraman. It's a double Ironman distance uh, triathlon. If one Ironman is miles. too easy. Yeah, it's yeah. like double, <laughs> 320 miles. It's a three-day stage race that circumnavigates the Big Island of Hawaii. And in 2009, it's broken into three days. The first day, you swim 6.2 miles and ride your bike 90 miles. The second day, you ride your bike 170 miles. And the third day, you, <sighs> it's a 52-mile run, <sighs> a double marathon. And in 2009, I won stage one by 10 minutes. So, and by I was like 43 minutes. years old at the time. So that was definitely a highlight of the, of my, athletic that had career. to feel pretty badass, especially it was, yeah, it was over pretty 40, cool. Yeah, I was yeah. 43, this lawyer, like I wasn't even like two years before that I was 50 pounds overweight sitting on the couch. So that was a pretty dramatic moment for me. Wow. Um, awesome. I ended up crashing my bike on the second day, which took me out of like podium condition, but I was just kind of lucky to finish that race. But um, and then in 2010, I did this thing called Epic Five, where a buddy and I did five Ironmans on five Hawaiian islands in under a week. So that was like finishing that was definitely something cool. How do you recover after something like that? I mean, that race was, I shouldn't even call it a race because it wasn't a race. I mean, Epic Five was really just an adventure. And in that, it was all about sleep deprivation and managing efficiency because it didn't matter how fast we did those Ironmans every day, but the longer you're out there doing it, the less sleep you get mm. and the less recovery. So it's finding that balance of exertion versus, versus, versus rest and, you know, trying to finish the Ironman in time to make the last flight off the Island to get to the next Island. Oh, like we were getting very little sleep. So I actually wasn't that sore or anything like that. I was just, I just needed to sleep for a week and then I was fine. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you have uh, favorite tools? Like, do you use float tank, cryo? Or do you use these tools? Like, I've just started doing cryo because there's a place near here that, that opened up not too long ago. We just got a clear light sauna and I'm starting to experiment with cold plunging and sauna. But that's relatively new. I mean, for me, recovery is, is I mean, the number one recovery tool is sleep. And sleep is like yeah. a super priority mm -hmm. to me. I get eight hours of sleep, you know, every night. And that's that's my number one, no matter what. Uh, and then beyond that, eating, you know, as much um, uh, anti-inflammatory foods as possible at the right times throughout the day, post-workout. That's super important to me. Uh, I don't have like Normatec boots and all the high fancy stuff, but I, you know, foam rolling, things like that are super important to me. I have that hyper ice foam roller that like oh, the agitate, vibrating one, the vibrating one yeah, which I've enjoyed. Yeah. So I, I do more and more stuff with that and, you know, compression gear here and there. And I love like that, that you but. said sleep because, uh, we always talk, people always ask us questions about all these crazy tools Yeah, and I'm, and 90% of the clients want the hacks. that I've ever trained yeah, yeah. Don't even sleep right. They're right. on their screens all the way till they go to go to bed, and and their sleep it, sweet sleep quality is terrible. But yet they want to know, you know, what tool should I be using? Do you have a, a system in place to make sure you get that good sleep? Or I mean, look, you know, I'm a I'm a dad of four kids. <laughs> you know, I don't always get my way, and, and our nephew lives here also. We have other people that are living here. You know periodically, like there's a lot of moving parts here. My wife is very busy doing lots of other things as well. So, you know, I don't live in a hermetically sealed, you know, you, you know, tank or live in a cabin in the woods by myself. So, um, you know, I always have to balance like what I would do for performance versus what's in the best interest of my kids and the family. So if it was up to me, I'm in bed at nine o'clock every night, mm. um, and up at five or six, uh, I don't always get to do that, but when I can, you know, I do do that. But I think to your point, um, yeah, everybody wants 
look, sleep's not sexy. Like the basics aren't sexy. You know, what's sexy is being able to buy this thing that costs four or 500 bucks that everybody thinks is going to make the difference. And, you know, those things are just in my, in my experience and in my opinion, um, a lot of people are, are afraid of the work and, Mm. and they spend a lot of time focusing on gear, you Mm -hmm. know, and they, they spend a lot of time like analyze it. Well, yeah, I'll run when I get like, well, I need the right watch. Like, right. should I get this watch? Should I get that watch? What kind of shoes do you wear? It's like, it doesn't matter, man. You right. don't need any of this stuff. Like what, there's just, these are just barriers in between you and doing that are induced by fear. God, so true. You know? mm-hmm. So true. You talked about anti-inflammatory foods. What are your, some of your favorites? Uh, a lot of turmeric uh, in my morning smoothies. Lots of actual turmeric. Yeah, turmeric itself. root. Um, I'm a big fan of of smoothies in my Vitamix. You got so a favorite recipe to get rid of that nasty taste? Or what? I don't. Yeah, I don't. Well, like I like the nasty taste now. Like my smoothies taste terrible. I'll just tell you straight <laughs> up. Keep like, it real. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's I don't have one specific recipe, but they always start with dark leafy greens like kale and and spinach and the like. Pre workout beets and beetroot you know, endurance booster for sure. Um, uh, lots of berries, blackberries, very high, you know, antioxidant turmeric, of course. So post-workouts more about the antioxidants, um, chia seeds, flax seeds, ground flax seeds, uh, hemp seeds, things like that. Spirulina, chlorella, uh, lots of greens, big on the greens. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. They make a, they make a big difference when I, uh, it's funny. We interviewed, um, who was it? Dr. Terry Walls. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she's she the, has a great story. Oh, yeah. she, fantastic oh my God. story. Yeah. That was, a, that story. was a cool story just yeah. cause she was one of our early on guests. I started eating vegetables like crazy after that interview. I'm not eating enough. Made a big difference. It made a very, very big difference to, mm-hmm. uh, dramatically increase my intake of, uh, of vegetables. Cause I thought I was eating a lot of vegetables, mm-hmm. but she's talking about eating, you know, three to six Large, like large plate, cup. yeah, yeah. fulls right. of vegetables. When I started doing that, I noticed just tremendous benefits and just everything from, like you said, inflammation to recovery, even strength. You mm-hmm. know, I even noticed, uh, you know, my lifts would go, would do better because I was mm-hmm. eating more of these things. So, um, cool. I, it's 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 interesting when you go through and you start to study nutrition and you get really deep into it. Although there are wide uh, variances between individuals, there are some general truths, and one of which is. Probably for most people, eating most mostly plants is probably the best thing mm-hmm. for most people, and it seems that way true for for everybody. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, look, you're preaching to the choir on that one, yeah. uh, but I think, you know, if you if you canvas, you know, the blue zones where people are living the longest uh, and have the less the least incidence of these chronic lifestyle illnesses that are killing millions of us unnecessarily. Uh, they're not necessarily a hundred percent plant-based, but they eat very little meat and their diet is, you know, comprised of a preponderance of, of vegetables and fruits and, and, you know, nuts and seeds. And on, the like. on that note, what do you think about the, when you look at like what's happening, I don't know how much you look at this, but like the bodybuilding world that's talking mm-hmm. two grams, three grams of protein per pound of body weight. Do you see that? Do you even pay attention to that? I'm not super up to speed on the bodybuilding world. Uh, I have friends that are vegan bodybuilders for what it's worth. Uh, I have opinions on the protein intake question. I mean, you know, I think that we're in a protein obsessed culture. Yes, we are. Uh, and that's, we talk about that all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's being fueled by crazy marketing interests that, mm-hmm. that want you to believe that you need massive amounts of protein, not to become necessarily a bodybuilder, but just to breathe air. Right. You know what I mean? Like if you're not, eating protein bars throughout the day and drinking yeah. a protein smoothie like immediately protein upon waking now. up in the yeah. morning that you're not going to be able to function. You mm-hmm. know, my experience personally is very different from that. I think that, uh, most people look, nobody's suffering from a protein deficiency. Most people are eating two or three times more protein than the recommended daily allowance. And they're not active like you guys, uh, to the extent that you want to build muscle like a bodybuilder, uh, you know, you guys would know more than I about what the protein requirements of that kind of athlete are, but I eat, I probably, I, I eat so little protein in comparison to like what everyone tells me I should. Uh, and the truth is, is that we're under this belief that the only way to get protein or the only protein that matters is protein that comes from, from, from animals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're talking about protein, what we're talking about is amino acids, the building blocks of protein. When you eat protein, you break it down into those amino acids anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, and specifically the nine amino acids that our bodies can't synthesize on their own. And we have to get them from the foods that we eat. And these, these amino acids are abundant in a wide variety of plants, right? Yeah. So 
you're getting them just lower on the food chain. And, you know, we could go down the rabbit hole and how those are assimilated and all of that. But, you know, I've been doing this for 11 years and I've been able to go out and kill it in my specialty and my specific discipline. And I've never, you know, had any issue building lean muscle mass or recovering. Um, and I'm 51 now, you yeah. know, and I can still go out and I just did this race as a, you know, as a 50 year old. So, um, you know, I think that we need to reframe and rethink this obsession with protein. And I think really it's one thing for me, like the skinny runner guy to talk about it, but it's, you know, it's guys like you, you know, who are in the gym, who are doing, you know, big heavy lifts and are in as part of that community to try to help translate, you know, or, or at least, uh, parse truth from fiction. I think that was what was so unique about our message. We, yeah, we, we blow can't... people away mm -hmm. when we talk about protein and say things like, you know, and we're talking to people who want to build point mass, seven. Right. Yeah. And we'll tell them, you know, it's probably a good idea to, to have low protein days to have days where you don't eat very much protein at all. And studies will actually show, and this is from a performance standpoint, that uh, you can actually desensitize, your your body becomes desensitized to protein. So when you do a protein fast and reintroduce protein, it becomes you become more efficient with how mm -hmm. you utilize it. You don't need nearly as much. But we do talk about this on the show all the time. We actually called it about three years ago where somebody had asked us a question where we thought, what's the next trend going to be in fitness? And I had said, uh, I think we're going to see a blowback. And we haven't seen it yet, but I think we will. And I, I know this is going to happen because I go into the grocery store and there's protein water and protein cereal <laughs> yeah. for kids. It's insane. And yeah. It's like the magic macronutrient. Like mm -hmm. nothing, you can't do any wrong with protein. It's been, we don't. Fortified with protein. And that's not true. And in fact, uh, I, you know, Dr. Mercola, we interviewed him once. And he, he said, his, in an opinion he has is that uh, the overconsumption of protein, he thinks may be worse than the overconsumption of processed carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I find that very, very fascinating. But, you know, it's our tendency to overdo things and we'll see. Well, we want to, you know, we're reductionist, right? We want to look at the one thing, whether it's the GPS watch or what's the one antioxidant food, the tumor, oh, it's all about the turmeric or the Normatec <laughs> boots or the cryotherapy. It's like, it's not any one of these things. And we need to broaden our aperture and understand that it is the highly complex, mind-boggling complex interplay of everything that we're doing that translates into the result that you seek. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. What is your, uh, I get, what is your dream now moving forward or have you already got You're already it? living your dream. Yeah. I'm living my dream. <laughs> You're yeah, living, living your I mean. dream right now. Listen, you know. Dude, I, the guy it, gets to talk to brilliant minds. He's running these races yeah, all over the world. Yeah. Like, I'm in what else for you? I'm in the bonus round. You know what I mean? Oh, like, cool I should be dead. It. You know, like, I. so I don't, I'm not always mindful of that. I get grouchy and resentful and competitive mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, is I am I am living my dream right now, and I and I want for nothing. Um, of course, I have aspirations. You know, I I just want to be able to continue to do the work that I do and try to um, impact uh, as many people as as profoundly as I can. And whether that's through a podcast or the books that I write or the public talks or the other kind of endeavors that I'm involved in, it doesn't really matter. What matters is maintaining the integrity of that message so that I can be helpful. What are current goals? Mm -hmm. Are you working on another book? Are you getting ready for another race? That's more important. Like where, where are your goals at right now? Yeah. So I, I just turned in a revised edition of Finding Ultra. It's been like five and a half years since that book came out. So I rewrote the whole book and that's coming out either in April or June. I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, my wife and I wrote a cookbook that's coming out in April. That's uh, called the Plant Power Way Italia, Italian uh, plant-based cookbook. And I'm working on a new book uh, that I'm not quite ready to talk about, but it will essentially be kind of a mind, body, spirit primer um, for wellness, leveraging not just my experience, but the experience of all the people that I've had on the podcast. So I'm looking forward to that. And in terms of athletic endeavors, I'm looking at the next thing. Uh, I'm not sure what it's what it's looking like yet. I have one idea that I'm working on that I'm not ready to say out loud yet, but uh, <laughs> it'll be something. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The next stay here. It's safe. Yeah, it was cool. You know, like I like I said, like I hadn't raced in five years uh, until I did this Otillo race this spring, and I and I realized in doing that, like, and the reason that I hadn't was. I really needed to figure out how to support my family without having to go back to being a lawyer and make it work. And so I was very invested in like trying to create structure around the various things that I do in a sustainable way so that I could continue to do them. And it took many years to figure that out. And then turning 50, I felt like doing something physical was relevant again, because 50 is like, uh, what can a 50 year old body do? And I realized in the experience of doing that race, like this is you know, a big part of who I am. And I don't want to go five years again without racing. Like I want to make it part of my life in a, in a more fundamental way, but it's, 
you know, it's, it's, you know, as you guys know, like, I, I think people don't realize how, how much work it takes to put on a podcast, mm-hmm. you know, when you want to do it right. Like it's a lot, right. Yeah. People think you just record and it's done, you know, it's like, yeah. that's the easy, that's the easy part. Right. <laughs> so there's a lot that goes into it and I'm juggling a lot of different stuff and I want to be a present dad and all those good things. So mm-hmm. it doesn't leave the amount of time for training that I would like to compete at the level that I think I'm capable of. And so for me, the journey has been about being okay with that. Well, you know, I could probably be faster, but like, can I just show up knowing I'm not at a hundred percent, I'm at maybe 80% and, and being cool with that. Well, Excellent. Well, listen. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. I was going to say, do you handle all of your podcasting stuff or do other people help you out with that? Uh, I've got a guy who edits the show for me who's great. He lives in Phoenix, so we work remotely. Um, and I have uh, a couple guys that work part time on me in like a, kind of uh, just a assistant capacity and do some web stuff and graphic stuff for me. Cool. So, yeah, I have help. I'm not doing it totally alone, but. But I'm also a bit of a control freak too, so <laughs> I, I probably need to distance myself and step back. And you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean, <laughs> so uh, I got this. yeah. Well, That's... I'm glad that we we finally met, man. And I, yeah. uh, you, you've got such a great message. You have a great message. You have a great story. I think uh, we need more people that are sharing good information and interviewing the type of people that you do. Uh, look forward when the book comes out and anything that we can do to help push it out and do yeah. stuff, man. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're here for sure. Thanks, guys. Yeah, sure. it's very cool Spread. to finally meet you because we see you all the time. Yeah. We're, you know, we're, we're yeah, bumping yeah. up. We're competitive and we, people. Yeah, and we too. see you yeah, out yeah, there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's all what the hell though. is that guy doing there? <laughs> Who is, what is Mind Pump? I've never heard of these guys. <laughs> yeah. How do they yeah. suddenly... Let's yeah. take them out. Yeah, I know, right? No, I love what you guys are doing. It's cool. And and you guys have a you have a very distinct voice and a fresh voice. And I love the format, and I uh, hope you guys keep oh, doing check it. Oh, you this out? Please, uh, yeah, yeah, consider, consider it, you know, me a resource, and right on, uh, man. look Much forward to your future success. Thanks Thank for you, coming man. on the That's show, awesome, brother. man. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Excellent. So uh, check out Mind Pump TV on YouTube. We post a new video every single day. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.